Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Eighty-six-year-old Patrick Carnes had a long drive ahead of him, but he wouldn't be traveling alone. He was joined, as always, by Lucky, his beloved dog. On the evening of Wednesday, April 13th, 2011, he got pulled over by a state trooper near Wells, Nevada, just five hours from home. Pat told the trooper he was heading to the town of Elko for the night, less than an hour away. After pulling back onto Interstate 80, Pat seemingly vanished. Less than nine hours after he was pulled over, his abandoned car was found near Galconda, more than 150 miles away, but both he and Lucky were gone. Investigators considered foul play, and when they made a discovery which linked Pat's case to that of a missing woman who had vanished from the same area just five years earlier, they began to wonder if they could be looking for the same suspect. Were they two separate random crimes or could there be a serial killer stalking the dark lanes of Interstate 80? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 139, The Disappearance of Patrick Carnes. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the disappearance of Patrick Carnes, who seemingly disappeared overnight in a nine-hour span of time. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also available on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions directly through the website or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Patrick Carnes was entering the last leg of a 2,000-mile journey when he mysteriously vanished. Nearly a decade later, and the desert of Nevada still conceals the truth. This is Episode 139, The Disappearance of Patrick Carnes. Have you ever noticed the difference between driving on the interstate in rush hour and driving the same roadway at night? Sure, there might be some frustration during the day. Cars jamming in all around you, speeds which decrease and increase for no apparent reason, aggressive drivers, slow drivers. It can really get on your nerves. But at night, it's good, right? Open roads, long stretches where you don't even see another car. While that can often get you to your destination faster and with less hassle, there's also something a bit eerie about it, something that plays in the back of your mind. If your tire blows out at 3 in the afternoon, you pull over, fix it, or call for help. If it happens at 3 a.m., you can't help but wonder who might pull over to assist you, a good Samaritan, or maybe someone with an evil agenda. Interstates crisscross and zigzag all throughout the United States. For many people, their experience is somewhat limited. The same stretch of road, the same few exits, the same familiar locations. A place which may seem innocuous to you could be terrifying to someone who's never been there before. The more rural things become, the more potential concerns there are. Nearly vacant lanes, wide open fields you can't really see into. Thick woods or brush, that creepy abandoned store or gas station you never want to stop at. You grow used to it when it's on your way home or the next town over. In a way, driving past it every day causes you to drop your guard. Sometimes, though, you're the one driving through a place you don't know, an area that makes you uncomfortable. No visible signs of life, no side roads or shortcuts that you know. Just exit after exit of the unknown. Most of us make it home, thankfully, 
but some never do. One of those who never did is Patrick Carnes. It was a moonless night in Nevada. Patrick Carnes was traveling westbound on Interstate 80, heading home to Reno. It was just before 9 p.m., and Patrick still had nearly five hours left. It became clear this was a trip he wouldn't finish that night, and maybe it was smarter to pull off somewhere and sleep for a bit before hitting the road again the next morning. As Patrick headed towards mile marker 358, he saw a tractor trailer which had been pulled over by the Nevada Highway Patrol. For reasons unknown, maybe a lack of familiarity with the law or just absence of mind, Patrick continued moving along in the right lane, passing the traffic stop at his normal rate of speed. Eight years earlier, Nevada had passed a law requiring drivers to, at a minimum, slow down when passing traffic stops, or better yet, move into the left lane. As Patrick zipped by the state trooper, he jogged back to his vehicle, pulled onto I-80, and quickly caught up. He flipped on his lights and pulled Patrick to the side of the road. They were approximately six miles east of the town of Wells when the officer approached and asked for Patrick's license and registration. During the course of their short interaction, Patrick explained he was driving home to Reno and was planning to stop in the town of Elko, just 50 miles up the road. He went on to explain that he'd been following a tractor trailer purely because it was heading to Elko. Taking pity on the older man, the officer let Patrick go without a ticket but warned him to keep an eye out, and to make sure he slowed down or moved over if he saw another traffic stop. Patrick agreed, and turning slightly to the officer as he prepared to walk away, he jokingly said, I'm never driving at night again. That was a snippet of the audio recorded during that traffic stop, with Patrick himself saying, I'm never driving at night again. Sadly, his words became prophetic, and he would mysteriously disappear before sunrise. Patrick Francis Carnes was born on January 30th, 1925 in Cleveland, Ohio. Pat, as he was better known, would be part of a large family having five sisters and one brother. At the age of 17, he enlisted in the Navy, becoming an aviation radio man for the Air Corps during World War II. Pat served in operations in Guadalcanal during the battle for the Solomon Islands. In 1946, after four years of service, he was honorably discharged, though he would be recalled the next year to serve as an aviation electronics technician. While stationed in Southern California, Patrick met and fell in love with Margaret Lila Haltom. The two were married in October of 1949, and just a year later, Patrick was honorably discharged for the second and final time. Patrick went on to attend UCLA earning a Bachelor in Business Studies. In 1954, he picked up a job with the Rand Corporation out of Santa Monica, and so he and Margaret would raise their family, three sons, and a daughter. Patrick retired in 1981, and he and Margaret decided to opt for a change of scenery, moving to Reno, Nevada. Together, the couple traveled around the country, frequently visiting family back in Ohio. Sadly, in 2004, Margaret passed away and Pat lost his partner of 55 years. Smart, devoted, and loving, Pat went forward with life, continuing to live as he always had, though he would go home to an empty house. Well, not entirely empty, as he was always accompanied by his beloved dog, a large 100-pound Akita mix named Lucky. In April of 2011, at the age of 86, Pat decided it might be time to move into a retirement home, and he began considering a location closer to family in Toledo. While Pat had made many trips to Ohio in the previous years, this trip was both business and pleasure. Spending time with family was a bonus to searching for a potential community to join. The drive out was easy. Pat and Lucky had made it without a hitch, and according to everything we know, the visit went well. Pat had seen several places that would make a good home for him, and so he was going to head back to Reno and make his decisions, once again heading back out on the road with Lucky for the long trip, covering more than 2,000 miles. He planned to arrive home on Thursday, April 14th. According to Pat's son, Jim, the 86-year-old was still in amazing shape and mentally sound. 
In a 2011 interview with Coast to Coast AM's George Knapp, conducted just weeks after his father's disappearance, Jim described him as, quote, very sharp. He still does the crosswords every Sunday and still has his wits about him. We wouldn't have let him drive across the country if we didn't think he was in shape for that. End quote. For the majority of the trip, Pat was moving along according to the plan. By the evening of Wednesday the 13th, he was less than five hours from home. However, it would be there that a mystery would begin, one which continues to haunt friends and family as well as investigators. Police have managed to construct somewhat of a timeline, due in part to the fact that Pat had gotten pulled over that night. Both dash cam footage and audio exist of that stop, and Pat seems to be in a good state of mind, maybe a little regretful of continuing to drive well into the night. According to the Nevada State Highway Patrol, Pat stopped adjacent to the Flying J Travel Park approximately two miles from the center of Wells. The stop only lasted for a few minutes, and the officer didn't think there was anything out of the ordinary nor any particular reason for concern. However, one detail of that stop has raised many questions. Prior to being stopped, the trooper had pulled over a tractor trailer. In his dash cam footage, another truck goes by, and seconds later we see Patrick's dark green Subaru Forester not far off from the passing truck. When Pat was pulled over, dash cam footage showed that he was still behind the same truck, not tailgating, but following closely. While talking to the trooper, Patrick explained, I'm only following him because he's going to Elko. I'm only following him because he's going to Elko. Elko was a town approximately 50 miles away, and this interaction seems to imply that Patrick was following the trucker who was heading to that town. In his early life, before settling into his career, Patrick had been a truck driver for a period of time, so it wasn't uncommon for him to talk with them and make friends with them. While no one knows for sure, it's been theorized that Pat may have befriended this driver at some point, then Elko came up and so Pat agreed to follow the driver so he could pull off for the night. In the dash cam footage, the truck Pat followed goes by, but it happens so quickly and the camera quality is so low that no one's been able to identify either a license plate or the company logo on the back of the trailer. Multiple attempts have been made to enhance it, but as of today, there has never been any confirmation. Investigators are very interested to speak with the driver who they believe could possess important information about Pat's whereabouts after that stop. He may, in fact, be one of the last people to have seen Pat. That section of Interstate 80, particularly at night, is populated almost entirely by truckers. Even during the day, it can be somewhat of a vacant stretch as there are no malls, stores, or places to stop outside of rest areas and truck stops. Elko was just another hour to the west, and had Pat continued on and exited there, he would have arrived no later than 10 p.m., about an hour after he was stopped. No one knows for sure whether or not Pat made it to Elko. In fact, no one seems to know where Pat went after he pulled back on the I-80, and it wouldn't be until nine hours later that anyone saw any trace of the 86-year-old. Approximately 6 a.m. on Thursday the 14th, Tracy Openlander, a part-time dispatcher for the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office, was making her way along I-80, heading to work at her other job. As she approached the area of exit 205, Pumpernickel Valley, approximately 150 miles to the west of where Pat had been stopped, she saw a vehicle in the sand well off the interstate. Being that it was early in the morning and the sun hadn't fully risen, she couldn't make out enough detail but assumed there had been an accident. Openlander called into the sheriff's office and notified them of the vehicle's location and continued on her way. A unit was dispatched out to the desolate area to see what was going on, but upon arriving, quickly discovered no accident had taken place. As the deputy approached, he found Pat's dark green Subaru stuck in the sagebrush. Due to the terrain, the vehicle was slightly high-centered, meaning that the ground beneath was uneven, supporting the undercarriage while the wheels were touching the ground but not completely supporting the vehicle. The car was parked with its front bumper nearly touching a wire fence, 
which left the vehicle facing towards the road. Observing the vehicle, the deputy noted that there didn't appear to be any damage to it, there were no signs of an accident, and there was no evidence of an injury. This being a very rural area of the Nevada desert, it isn't entirely unheard of for people to abandon their vehicles in this way. It's also extremely common for people to just park and go hiking in the desert, so initially, there didn't appear to be any kind of an emergency. The deputy radioed in the vehicle information so the owner could be contacted, and it came back registered to Patrick Carnes. No outstanding warrants or tickets. A call was placed to Pat's apartment in Reno, but receiving no answer, police made note of it in their incident report and moved on. At that point, there wasn't anything left to do, so the deputy took a look around the area for a few minutes, returned to his cruiser, and headed back on patrol. Several days passed, during which time Pat's family had become aware that he hadn't gotten home. According to Jim, Pat's sister first grew concerned that her brother, who should have been home already, hadn't contacted anyone, and subsequent calls to his house went unanswered. The same day that his vehicle was found, several members of Pat's family began looking for him. At first, no one knew for sure. Could he have stopped off to visit a friend or maybe made some detours extending the duration of his trip? A few more days passed until Sunday, April 17th. A sheriff's deputy passing down I-80 noticed that the green Subaru was still parked in the same place, and though they had tried before, no one had yet been able to get in touch with Pat. At that time, the sheriff's office contacted the Reno Police Department to request that they perform a welfare check. Pat's family had come to a similar conclusion, and both police and two of Pat's sons arrived at his apartment nearly simultaneously. After police learned that Pat had never returned from Ohio, they immediately filed a missing persons report. The Humboldt County Sheriff's Office is located in Winnemucca, approximately 20 miles to the west of where the Subaru was found by exit 205, between Golconda and Battle Mountain. Upon being notified of the situation by Reno police, sheriff's investigators were dispatched back to the Pumpernickel Valley to re-examine the vehicle and look for any signs of Pat. According to the Charlie Project, Pat's vehicle was noted as having gas in the tank and being fully functional. There didn't appear to be any mechanical issues. Looking inside, Pat's personal belongings were there and accounted for, including his checkbook. The car wasn't in a state of disarray, nor did it appear that anyone had been going through it. While the vehicle didn't appear to offer any answers, investigators noticed that there was a trail of footsteps in the dirt leading away from the Subaru. While the scene itself didn't seem strange at first, one detail suddenly occurred to investigators. The Subaru was found on the south side of the interstate, with its front facing the eastbound lanes. If Pat had left the vehicle there, perhaps stopping to use the bathroom or walk the dog, he should have been on the north side since he was heading west. The more police looked, the more they began to get the impression that this wasn't a situation that involved Pat abandoning his car or stopping to use the bathroom and getting lost in the desert at night. It seemed more likely that someone had dumped the vehicle there, and from early on, investigators began formulating a theory that it might not have been Pat who left the car in that spot. Due to the limited resources of the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office, the car was sent to Washaw County, where Reno is, to be processed by their crime lab. Unfortunately, no evidence was actually found. There were no legible fingerprints recovered, no traces of blood, no signs of a struggle. Pat's map was found in the vehicle. He had mapped out his entire trip and plotted points to stop at, and it was quickly noted that the Pumpernickel Valley was not one of those locations. Both Battle Mountain and Galconda were circled, with the spot his car was later found right between them. While it was hoped that Pat's path could be tracked through financial records, it was later discovered that he had no credit cards and paid for everything with cash. Beyond that, he didn't own a cell phone, so there was nothing to trace. While the car was being examined, a massive search effort was launched to try and find any trace of Pat. The desert in that area is quite sprawling, and if Pat had wandered away and gotten lost, he could have come across any number of dangers. Not to mention, being that he disappeared overnight, 
That area is incredibly dark, making it difficult to avoid any kind of terrain changes, especially on a moonless night like the 13th. Pat's family told investigators that he had recently injured his leg and as such was walking with a slight limp, which suggested that had he wandered off, he probably wouldn't have gone very far. Both Humboldt County and Washoe County Sheriff's investigators were involved in the search, which in total exhausted nearly 700 man hours. Four aerial searches were conducted in addition to on-the-ground grid searches. Investigators looked for seven straight days but were never able to come up with anything that might give them a direction to go. Searchers were perplexed by the lack of evidence, but this may have been due in part to weather. Humboldt County Under Sheriff Curtis Cull explained, quote, We had trackers at the location, but we had horrible spring weather here this past couple of months, so we may have lost some tracking because of snow and heavy rains. It just has this appearance that Pat was there and then he was gone, end quote. Police received a lot of tips as the case began picking up media coverage, but they never got one which gave them anything solid. Interestingly, Reno police did receive a call from a trucker who thought he had seen something. While he didn't witness anything to do with Pat himself, he claimed that just three days after the car had been found, he saw a dog not far from exit 205. When he was later shown a picture of Lucky, he thought it was the same dog. Unfortunately, if it was, Lucky has never been found, though his presence there could indicate that maybe Pat was still in the area. While police were doing their part, Pat's family began working on their own end. Pat's son, Jim, was joined by his uncle, who's a former Toledo area police officer, as well as by his brother, who's worked as a private investigator. They produced missing persons flyers, which were posted around towns, but especially in truck stops and spots where travelers frequently go. In terms of canvassing the area, there wasn't much that could be done considering how isolated it is. As Jim explained to George Knapp, quote, you go out there and it's not like you could go door to door to talk to someone and ask if they'd seen anything or were even around. There's really nothing you can grab a hold of, end quote. When the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office became aware of the Highway Patrol dash cam footage, they put countless hours into analyzing it. Several attempts have been made to enhance the video in hopes of being able to identify the truck Pat was following, but those attempts have been unsuccessful. Outside of the link to that truck, one other detail interested investigators. Earlier, I played a clip of Pat explaining that he was, quote, only following him because he's going to Elko. End quote. Under Sheriff Cull believes this implies Pat must have spoken to that driver at some point to know where he was going. He has since speculated that Pat may have met this driver at a truck stop, possibly across the border in Utah. I'm only following him because he's going to help him. Sadly, Pat's case began growing cold despite the fact that Under Sheriff Cull took the case personally and worked hard to keep the story in the media. Tips, which had never flooded in, began drying up completely. Then, investigators came across a bizarre coincidence, which began to make them wonder if Pat's disappearance could be connected to another unsolved case. 62-year-old Judith Ellen Casita was married and living in Reno in 2006. According to her husband, the couple was having issues, and on February 14th, Valentine's Day, he found a note apparently left behind. Reportedly, the note expressed that Judith was very depressed over the state of the marriage, as well as the path her life had taken, and she was leaving the state. Witnesses reported seeing Judith driving away from her home in her 1991 white Mazda pickup truck. She was later spotted by witnesses at a McDonald's in the town of Lovelock, approximately 100 miles to the east. This is the last official sighting of Judith. She was reported missing by her husband, and while investigators worked her case, much like that of Patrick Carnes, they found little, if any, evidence and few details which might give them a better sense of where she might have gone. Then, less than a month later, they got a major break. On Sunday, March 5th, Reno police were contacted by the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. 
Nevada State Highway Patrol had located an abandoned 1991 white Mazda pickup registered to Judith Casita. While the circumstances of Judith's disappearance seem to be somewhat different than those of Pat Carnes, they do share one glaring commonality. When police found Judith's truck, it was parked just off exit 205 of I-80. In fact, it was parked in nearly the exact same spot that Pat's car would be found in five years later. While coincidences do happen, for investigators, this was far too much to be a mere coincidence. As Under Sheriff Cull later put it, quote, There's a lot of exits along this interstate. This is a big piece of real estate. And to have two vehicles at the exact same spot, if that doesn't grab your attention, then I don't know what will. End quote. In the five years that passed between Judith and Pat's disappearances, her case grew cold, and to this day, very little information is available. While Pat's case got more attention, due in part to the efforts of police and his family to keep it in the spotlight, it too was growing cold quickly. Police began working their way through several theories. Was it possible Pat could have wandered off and gotten lost in the desert? They don't consider it likely since he had sustained a leg injury and their extensive searches turned up nothing. Could a hitchhiker have been responsible? That was a possibility, though Pat's family is firm in their belief he would never pick up a hitchhiker, and being that far out in the middle of nowhere, it seemed unlikely the car would have been abandoned in the desert rather than in a city or at a truck stop. Galconda is 12 miles to the west. A rest area was 10 miles to the east. Had someone stashed a vehicle in either location, it would have taken them between two and three hours to walk back. At night, as dark as that area is, if they walked just a little off the road, no one would have even seen them. Ultimately, investigators came down to one specific set of criteria which they would apply to theories. Considering the desolate location and the belief that Pat was not the person who had left the Subaru in the desert, it became likely that more than one suspect was involved. This theory manifests in one of two ways. Either Pat ran into people who robbed and killed him before dumping his car in the desert, or maybe a truck driver in association with a partner lured Pat into a trap. It's possible Pat could have stopped somewhere, maybe even in Elko, and been accosted by the suspect or suspects. Unfortunately, we have no way of knowing if Pat ever made it there. There is a Department of Transportation substation in Elko whose cameras may have captured Pat's vehicle or any other vehicles in the area that night, but for whatever reason, those cameras were not functioning at that time, adding only more mystery to an already confounding case. Under Sheriff Cull put forth a scenario in which a truck driver, pretending to be friendly, offered to let Pat sleep in his trailer while he drove. This driver would have had someone with him who would drive Pat's car. Pat, likely trusting of a fellow truck driver, may have agreed not knowing the true intent was to rob and kill him, abandoning his car along the way. Were that the case, Cull noted, Pat could be anywhere. There's a lot of interstates and highways leading in all different directions not far from the Pumpernickel Valley. In hopes of gaining further insight, investigators consulted with the FBI. It was thought the Bureau might be able to create a profile for a potential suspect, but due to the utter lack of information, they weren't able to do so. However, it was noted that beginning in 2009, an FBI task force was examining potential serial killers working as truck drivers. In total, they created a map which represented the locations of more than 500 homicide victims who had been found along or close to highways and interstates. Through their work, they were able to note more than 200 potential suspects, at least 10 of which they managed to charge and arrest. According to the FBI, the majority of the victims were female, living transient lifestyles and often linked to drugs, sex work, or both. Many of the victims were believed to have frequented truck stops where they would be picked up or abducted, later to be killed and dumped along the road. Due to the changes in location and jurisdiction, it was very difficult to link multiple homicides together because other departments were often unaware of what was found 500 miles down the road. Tracking down potential suspects was made difficult since if they were truck drivers, they were often on the move, 
and the vast majority of these crimes had no direct witnesses. Under Sheriff Cull has been fairly open about the possibility that Patrick and perhaps Judith could have been victims of a truck driver or maybe more than one who are also doubling as serial killers. Based on the area in which both cars were found, it's strongly believed that whoever was responsible was extremely familiar with that location. They know how desolate it is and how unlikely it would be for someone to pass by during the early morning hours. It's also been speculated that the suspect or suspects could have previously, or maybe currently, lived in the same area, likely within 50 miles. Cull discussed the behaviors of the suspects, defining them as predators and opportunists. He explained their thought process to George Knapp, saying, quote, These predators, they look at you and they size you up, basically like animals. Is this someone I can take? Or is this someone that will be a threat to me? End quote. There's been a lot of debate about a potential motive for the crimes. If it were robbery, sure, they may have gotten cash from Pat, but why leave all of his other belongings behind? If it were just murder, why go through the trouble of concealing the body somewhere when they could easily have left Pat or Judith near their vehicles or along the side of the highway? For under Sheriff Cull, the true answer may be more disturbing. He explained, quote, Sometimes you don't need a motive. The world outside of law enforcement is always looking for a motive, and I think what scares us in the business, sometimes we realize there doesn't have to be a motive. These predators are career criminals and what have you. They just do this because they don't know anything else. This is just what they do. End quote. In April of 2014, Pat's family had him legally declared deceased. For more than nine years now, they have conducted their own searches, talked about his case on television and radio, and spread flyers from Ohio to California and back. They maintain both a Facebook page and a website, trying to keep Pat's name alive. But after all this time, there's never been a single new detail revealed. No one's called in any important tips. No one's reported a sighting of Pat. And outside of one alleged sighting of Lucky, it's almost as if he and his dog vanished off the face of the earth. When last seen, Patrick Francis Carnes was described as being an 86-year-old white male, standing 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing 180 pounds with blue eyes and gray hair. He was last seen wearing a tan jacket, blue plaid shirt, tan or beige pants, tan canvas shoes, and a Toledo Mudhens baseball cap. Pat also wears eyeglasses. He was last seen just outside of Wells, Nevada, and his vehicle was found 150 miles to the west, near Winnemucca. If alive today, Pat would be 95, though both investigators and his family believe he is likely deceased. When last seen, Judith Ellen Casita was described as being a 62-year-old white female standing 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighing 138 pounds with hazel eyes and gray hair. Her maiden name is Hubbard, and she has a scar which runs from her neck to her abdomen. It's unknown what she was wearing at the time of her disappearance. She was last seen alive at a McDonald's restaurant in Lovelock, Nevada, and her truck was found abandoned 100 miles to the west just off exit 205 of I-80. Judith had family in Oregon, and it's speculated she may have been heading that way when she disappeared. Patrick Carnes was a hard-working, devoted father who loved his family and was acutely aware that he was entering the twilight of his life. Just as he was beginning plans to move back to Ohio and settle near relatives, he seems to have completely disappeared in a span of no more than nine hours along with his beloved dog, Lucky. His car, a green Subaru Forester, was found abandoned at the same location where Judith Casita's truck had also been found five years earlier. Two missing people, two abandoned vehicles, and a vast emptiness of desert and darkness. When asked about his father, and the difficulty of not knowing what became of him, of not having the ability to lay him to rest, Jim explained, quote, Personally, I've come to the realization that he may not be with us today. We just want to know what happened. Dad was a good guy.
When I think of driving across the country, my concerns are usually rooted in the expected. An accident, a major delay, car trouble. I don't find myself thinking about the possibility that I might not make it home and that my loved ones may never learn the truth of what happened to me. For Patrick Carnes, this was a trip he'd made a lot. He was experienced, intelligent, and capable. Somehow, he managed to cover nearly 1,500 miles before he ran into something, or maybe someone, and while his journey was halted, the marathon to find out the truth is only beginning. Pat's family has lingered in the limbo of unknowing for nearly a decade, And while they've managed to find a way to proceed with their lives, that doesn't mean they don't think about Pat's disappearance all day, every day. I can't begin to imagine how many times they must wonder what happened, how many hours, weeks, months, and years they've spent going over the evidence, considering theories, trying to find an answer. As for investigators, they too must weigh the odds and go over the evidence, but in the end, there isn't much to tell the story. What they do have only obscures things. A set of footprints, the blurry image of a truck, a mention of following a trucker to Elko. Most investigators connected to the case haven't said much, if anything. However, Under Sheriff Curtis Cull has been very outspoken with his opinions and theories. In one particular interview, he noted that when you examine the big picture, when you look at everything they know, there's only one answer that makes sense, and that answer is foul play. Some people completely agree. For others, there's likely a more direct answer, something much less complicated and difficult to imagine. It becomes in the end a question of what you can prove, though, not what you believe. And in this case, all we can really prove is that Patrick Carnes and his dog Lucky vanished between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. along a desolate, lonely stretch of I-80. Before I move into the theories, I wanted to take a moment to address the case of Judith Casita which may or may not be connected to Pat's disappearance. As we progress forward, I'll make certain references to the known details, primarily the location both cars were found, but I'm not going to address any major theories that revolve solely around Judith's case as, due to a dramatic lack of information, I feel it would be inappropriate to just broadly speculate. While Pat's case is majorly lacking evidence, I could find almost nothing about Judith's. One short article, a few missing persons flyers, and a very limited Charlie Project entry. So I think it's best we focus on Pat, and maybe in the future we can dig deeper into Judith's story. When it comes down to the theories considered possible in Pat's case, there are essentially three which are deemed most likely. Some believe there was no foul play involved, and that Pat may have wandered away from his car in the dark and gotten lost, injured, or worse. In terms of foul play, There's two angles that are debated, whether this was a random crime or if it's part of a series which may connect to Judith and possibly others who have never been linked by law enforcement. So we'll begin with Pat getting lost and then we'll move into foul play. The area in which Pat's car was found is incredibly desolate, vast, and at night, dark enough that you can't see your hand in front of your face. Looking at photos of the scene, the Subaru is tilted slightly to the left, wheels dug into the dirt. It somewhat looks like someone got stuck, because the earth around the front wheel seems to indicate that someone tried to get the car out of there but couldn't, and so it just spun and they dug themselves in. We know Pat told the trooper he was stopping in Elko, 50 miles away, but his car was found an extra 100 miles further on, on the wrong side of the interstate. Some have speculated that Pat missed the exit. Others believe he still felt awake enough to drive and decided to try and get closer to home. We have the audio of Pat saying he's not going to drive at night again, but that doesn't mean he couldn't have changed his mind or began to feel a little more comfortable since the roads were empty and he really didn't have to worry about traffic. That being said, one of the biggest mysteries of this case is whether or not Pat ever made it to Elko or if he kept going on purpose or by mistake. I've seen a lot of speculation that he may have become tired or perhaps disoriented and found himself lost. I don't think that's entirely impossible. I know I've driven long distances at night and from time to time find myself wondering just where in the hell I am. So let's imagine the scenario. Pat gets an idea in his head of where he plans to stop. He misses that point and somewhere down the line realizes he's in an unfamiliar area. So he pulls off exit 205, 
crosses over, and pulls up near the fence, maybe to look at his map, maybe to stretch his legs and let Lucky run around. It's dark. His headlights only reveal so much, and before he knows it, he's gotten himself stuck. Considering the limited traffic in the area, he decides not to wait at his car and turn the flashers on. Instead, he goes out trying to find help himself. Maybe Lucky sees an animal and runs off and he chases him. Maybe he's just confused and unsure of where to go. These possibilities have to be considered, unlikely or not. Now, I think most people would walk towards the highway, not into the darkness of their unknown surroundings, and maybe he did. Maybe he got down the road and someone picked him up, or he ended up injured, perhaps fatally, and couldn't get out of the situation he found himself in. If he had driven straight from the point where he was pulled over to the spot where the Subaru was found, he'd have arrived between 12 and 12.30 a.m. That gives him a good six-hour head start before anyone even notices his car. Several more days would pass before anyone began searching. He could have gone quite a distance. But there's some issues with this. Firstly, we know his leg was injured and he was limping, so I can't imagine him wanting to walk very far. Secondly. Hundreds of hours of searching took place all over that area. Pat's family continues to search from time to time today. How is it possible, even if he did wander off, that four days later not a single thing was found? It's not like enough time had passed for him to have become skeletalized, and his clothing would surely have been recognizable. While he was dressed in mostly tan, which doesn't help in a desert search, the blue of his shirt might have stood out a bit. Considering how much time has been spent in that area, it's difficult to imagine Pat is anywhere around there, but we've seen cases before when someone is found, years later, in an area that was searched multiple times. Police, though, have been fairly specific in their belief that Pat was not the person who left the car there. What they based that on, I can't be sure. The details have never been revealed. But there are certain factors which I think could play a role. We all know all of his belongings were found in the car, including his checkbook. There's no mention of his keys, though. I wish we knew whether or not they were found. Was the driver's seat adjusted for a short or tall person? Did the footprints found not match Pat's shoe size? It's difficult to examine too deeply when you don't have these answers, but it seems clear something about the scene convinced seasoned investigators that Pat was never there. So, while it's entirely possible that he could have parked there and been lost somewhere on foot, I'm inclined to believe that the investigators who know all of the details would have a pretty good reason to believe this was not the case. That being said, we'll move into foul play, which most people believe is where the answer lies. In this situation, we have a choice, whether this was random or if there's a connection elsewhere. So, we'll begin with random. It wouldn't be surprising at all if this was a random crime. We know Pat carried cash, we know he talked to truckers and stopped multiple times along the way. I don't think it's out of the question he could have come across someone who saw that cash and wanted it, or maybe someone who was just looking to do something terrible. Like Under Sheriff Cull said, predators don't necessarily have a motive or a plan. They just see an opportunity and go for it. I suppose the question would be, where exactly Pat encountered the suspect or suspects? In a town? At a truck stop? somewhere along the road? Unfortunately, we have no way of knowing, but you could imagine scenarios for all of them. He gets to Elko and someone pulls a gun. He goes to a truck stop and someone's waiting to strike. While his family says he would never pick up a hitchhiker, would he just casually drive by someone on the side of the road calling out for help or feigning car trouble? So maybe he pulls over. Someone pops out and now you've got a scenario where one person was the bait and drives their vehicle while the other takes Pat in his own. Based on the fact that his car was found off the eastbound lanes, the opposite direction of his travel, that could imply he made it past that point and the suspect drove it back. Or maybe it was just an easy place to ditch the car and it was big enough for a second car to pull in, or maybe just wait on the shoulder since there don't appear to be another set of tire prints. I also think we have to consider the possibility that someone could have been posing as a police officer or some kind of other authority figure. I think the car, being left where it is, definitely leans more towards foul play than the possibility that Pat parked the car there himself and got stuck. 
I tend to agree with Cull that it seems like a dump, not something someone would normally do. However, it's strange because nothing was taken. It doesn't look like anyone tore through the car looking for anything of value. They just drove it there and left. No legible prints were picked up, which doesn't mean that there are not unidentified prints in the car, just that they aren't clear enough to be matched to anyone. However, it was a cold night in the low 30s. I wouldn't be surprised if the suspect was wearing gloves. I've often wondered about the reason for dumping the car. Was it just a matter of getting rid of it somewhere, or if it had been left where it originally was, would the suspect think that would incriminate them? If you're looking at a local, that makes sense. If you're talking about a truck driver who's passing through, I don't think it much matters where the car is found. Unfortunately, we don't know how much gas was left in the car. That information could be used to determine an estimate on where it was last filled up, maybe give a better idea of where Pat may have gone after he was pulled over. So much of this case revolves around Exit 205 and its connection to Judith Casita. I suppose what you have to determine is whether or not that location definitely indicates a connection or if it's a coincidence. There's also the possibility that the suspect could have remembered Judith's case and figured dumping the car there might throw suspicion in another direction, get police thinking this is the same suspect when maybe there's no connection at all. In a random scenario, I don't know how much I buy that, but I can't completely dismiss it. If we're talking a local, they'd likely remember Judith's truck being found just five years earlier. I think we also have to consider Pat could have pulled into that location himself and someone attacked him, maybe trying to steal the car only to discover that it was stuck. This could have been a random crime. Oftentimes in investigations, it's incredibly difficult to dismiss something as pure coincidence and understandably so. In this case, I really struggle with it. So much of me believes it couldn't be a coincidence, but maybe I've been compromised by it. Maybe it's because it's one of the few things that could actually shed some light on this case. If it is connected, you have a much better idea of what you're looking for than if it's happenstance. If we knew more about Judith's case, maybe we'd be able to figure out some more of this. Many people, though, including Under Sheriff Cull, don't believe there is anything coincidental here. And in their minds, these were two crimes perpetrated by the same person or group of people. The FBI study about serial killer truck drivers is interesting and disturbing. More than 500 murders examined and more than 200 potential suspects, and that's just for the time the task force was operational. There's a few basic reasons police began looking at truckers, primarily because of the video in which Pat says he's following the driver to Elko. That, for many people, suggests a connection. Maybe they met at a truck stop along the way, and the guy told Pat he was going to Elko so he should follow him. That, of course, doesn't mean he was actually going to Elko. Maybe he was going to a desolate field off the interstate. Another reason is purely because I-80 in that area at night is populated mostly by truckers. There's not a lot of people on the road driving through the middle of nowhere, so it seems less likely you're just going to run into someone who isn't making a long haul. Finally, Pat had been a trucker, liked truckers, and seemed to trust them. If he told the suspect he had been a trucker, this may have opened a door to duping him with a false sense of trust and camaraderie. So, is that the answer? It makes sense. Truck drivers are on the move a lot. There's no real accounting for what they're up to, especially during their non-driving hours, and multiple victims spread across a wide area makes it difficult to connect the dots. But if that is the case, how many of those truck drivers left their victims or their vehicles in the exact same place? You figure, a criminal does something, and it works. It's familiar, it's comfortable, so why not do it again? But I guess you also have to ask, why go out of your way to make that connection for the police? Sure, we know some killers have egos and want police to know they did it. They want to taunt them, and there's been some debate that that could have happened here. Basically, hey, it's been five years and you haven't found me yet, so here's another one to torment you. It's sick and it's twisted, but so are killers. Cull put out the theory that maybe a trucker befriended Pat ran into him at a truck stop or a station along the way. Pat mentioned he was tired and trying to get to a place to rest. 
This trucker has someone with him, offers to let Pat sleep in his rig while his friend or significant other or whoever it is drives the Subaru behind them. Pat agrees, thinking he can trust this person. And by the time he realizes what went wrong, it's too late. A lot has been said about Lucky, that he may have intimidated a potential suspect, but if Lucky stayed in the Subaru with the co-suspect, and Pat had made Lucky comfortable with that person, he might not have done anything. The trucker easily could have told him he was allergic to dogs, or he didn't want the dog in his bed. Maybe that could explain Lucky possibly being sighted near exit 205 three days later. He could have been in the car when it was dumped there. A truck driver is certainly a possibility. Evidence would suggest that disagreeing with that would be foolish. In that area at that time, you've got a lot of potential suspects. Now, whether or not the driver Pat was following was involved, I couldn't say. In some cases, police have seemed to lean one way and then the other, sometimes saying he could be a witness, other times that he may have been involved. The fact that this guy's never surfaced, never phoned in, never presented himself to speak to police does make it somewhat suspicious. If he truly drives that area as part of his route, there's no way he wouldn't have heard about this if not from the flyers and news reports than from other truckers. A lot of effort's been going into trying to identify the logo on the back of the trailer, and from what I've seen, no one's been able to do it yet, but technology keeps getting better. The image, even enhanced as it currently is, is blurry and somewhat open to interpretation. It's like a Rorschach test. Whatever you happen to see there is what's there. A part of me believes if this guy wasn't involved, he'd have surfaced by now. A lot of truckers keep logs. They know where they were when this happened. Plus, if this guy did tell Pat he was going to Elko, how could he not remember that conversation? On the other hand, maybe he did run into Pat told him to follow him, and at some point, Pat turned off the road or never caught up after being pulled over. You'd imagine once you heard about the case, you'd remember enough to tell police, so he could be hiding something, but he could also just be oblivious. We don't know for sure that this guy ever spoke to Pat, though. Maybe Pat overheard him saying he was going to Elko. Maybe he asked someone where would be a good place to stop for the night, and they said, uh, Elko, and pointed, saying, well, that truck's heading there, follow him. Honestly, there's no way to know. If there was a conversation, I'd be inclined to think this guy was involved. Unless someone comes forward with that information, though, we have no way to directly connect the driver to this crime. As much as we may want to. So a truck driver committing a random crime or a serial killer striking once again. We've seen our fair share of serial killer truck drivers. Robert Ben Rhodes and Keith Hunter Jesperson, a.k.a. the Happy Face Killer to name two. But if we move away from a trucker, then we're left with a handful of possibilities. It could be like any of the random crimes we discussed earlier, but as part of a series. If you hang around certain areas and find victims there, you'll go back there to hunt. Plus, how many people really pay attention to what random folks at a truck stop, gas station, or rest area are doing? The only people who are there regularly are people who work there, and from everything I've seen, Not many, if anyone, remembered Pat, let alone someone who may have been hanging around with him or near him. I do find that kind of somewhat surprising. I feel like I'd remember an 86-year-old with a cute dog, but that's just me. So, you could be looking at serial killers who operate in that area and prey on people they think make easy targets. An 86-year-old man, a 62-year-old woman, out on an empty stretch of I-80, maybe filling up and grabbing a bite. The killer has time to watch, to get a feel for whether or not they want to target these people. It's obviously not about their vehicles or stealing what might be inside them. Maybe it's that desire to kill, or perhaps just robberies that go wrong. I certainly think you could be looking at a serial with a direct connection to both Judith and Pat, but I also can't rule out that there's no solid connection other than the same patch of dirt off a vacant interchange. Hopefully, it never happens again. But should another vehicle turn up in that spot, most doubt might be erased. A lot of people wonder, if it was the same people, why the five-year gap? Some think the killer may have been in prison for that stretch. Others argue that the driving routes could have changed, and yet still there's some who think he never stopped, but simply hasn't been tied to any of his other crimes. All we know for sure 
is that someone stole Patrick Carnes from his family. They robbed him of his remaining years, took away a father, brother, grandfather, and great-grandfather. Pat was a World War II veteran who had spent his life taking care of his family, building a future, and creating solid roots. It seems bitterly tragic for it all to end on a dark road in the middle of nowhere, both so close and so far from home. There's a lot of truckers out there, probably at this very moment, sailing right past exit 205. How many of them know Pat's story? How many people at truck stops see his missing persons flyer and wonder what happened? If nothing else, we know at least one person out there has that answer. And if under Sheriff Cull is correct, more than one person. For nearly 10 years, Pat's family has had to wrestle with what happened. Had to accept that a man who so loved them, who worked hard for them, who fought in a war and raised a family, is gone, and they couldn't protect him as he had protected them. In the end, maybe the best anyone can do is find the truth, solve this horrible crime, and see someone sentenced to spend the rest of their life behind bars. Unfortunately, without new information, the discovery of new evidence or a confession, the disappearance of Patrick Carnes will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Patrick Carnes, Coast to Coast AM did an episode in 2011 interviewing Jim as well as Under Sheriff Cull. America's Most Wanted also ran a segment. The family maintains the website patcarnsmissing.wordpress.com as well as the Facebook group Patrick Carnes Missing. If you have any information about the disappearance of Patrick Carnes, please contact the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office at 775-623-6429. You can also leave an anonymous tip with Secret Witness at 775-322-4900. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, Message me on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod or comment in the Facebook group. Did you know that CrimeCon is coming to the United Kingdom and will be in London on June 12th and 13th, 2021? And I'll be there representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row. I'm really looking forward to being a part of this amazing event. And if you're considering going, you can use the promo code TRACE21 for 10% off your ticket. That's Trace21 for 10% off. Visit crimecon.co.uk for more information. Trace evidence would not be possible without the amazing support of you incredible listeners. So I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers. Special thanks to Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Astrid Nyer, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dearthy, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kevin Bonham, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah, Sarah Mascaratolo, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. You're all amazing and your contributions are greatly appreciated, as are all patrons. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or visit trace-evidence.com for further information. That's going to wrap things up for this week. But I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.